welcome to in the course of advanced geotechnical engineering this is module 7 lecture 5 on geotechnical physical modeling so this is lecture 5 on geotechnical physical modeling and module 7 so in the previous lecture we introduced ourselves to number of centrifuge based you know the limitations which are actually involved with the centrifuge based physical modeling and they are basically listed here non homogeneity and anisotropy of soil profiles which is difficult to model in centrifuge based physical modeling and limitations of the modeling tools and variation of g level with the horizontal distance and depth of the model and subsequent errors and then we also have said that how these errors can be minimized by selecting an appropriate configuration of the equipment and the boundary effects which are between the walls of the container and soil and the scale effects which is because of the our inability to not able to scale down the particle size then one of these scale effects is called particle size effects or grain size effects and we discuss how these particle size effects can be averted by doing you know especially using the principle of centrifuge modeling we call modeling of models. Then after having you know once we introduce ourselves to you know the scaling laws then we realize that there are different scale factors for time for different types of forces like seepage forces or creep forces or viscous forces or weight forces then you know the inconsistency of the scale factor for time then we also discussed that whenever there is a motion of the body happens within the model then we said that you know it is going to subject to you know two types of accelerations one is Euler acceleration and second one is Coriolis acceleration the as far as the uh, centrifuge modeling is concerned Euler acceleration is not uh, uh, very serious uh, because uh, there is no much change of angular acceleration uh, because of that the Euler acceleration term uh, is uh, uh, limited then but what uh, we are having is that if you are releasing uh, let us say uh, you know sand particles onto the soft soil for enabling the construction of uh, embankments on soft soil or releasing you know certain weight at a certain onto the acceleration gravity field. So these situations arise to cause you know Coriolis effect then also seismic perturbance which also can cause you know these you know Coriolis effect then we also discussed it that for a Coriolis effect to be you know negligible we said that the velocities have to be as small as possible like either the smallest possible like this as small as 0 0.05 times v where v is the model velocity if the event is also very fast like a blast event or a projectile event wherein the ejecta is thrown at very very high speed in such situations also we said that you know the Coriolis effect is negligible in the sense that the ejecta will be thrown with a very rapid speed and it goes and hits the periphery of the container walls. So we need to also when the explosion events are actually modeled in high at high gravity there is a need for you know putting sacrificial you know sheets along the periphery this helps in reducing or denting the, the container boundaries otherwise what will happen is that the container boundaries are subjected to you know serious errors due to denting. So when if the velocities of the moving particle within the model within the say greater than 0 0.05 times the velocity of V with which the model is moving and less than 2 times V then we said that the Coriolis effect is cannot be ignored and need to be considered and for that we have to see and how you know the Coriolis effect can be minimized. So those models which are being tested with the velocities in the range of greater than 0 0.05 V and less than 2 V we need to check whether the model is free from the Coriolis effect or not. <coughs> so 
So the Coriolis force arises from any movement that occurs within the centrifuge model that is what we have been discussing and for example if you try to construct an embankment by raining sand in flight or if you drop a ball from the center of the centrifuge to study the projectile motion the impact on the soil or the simulation of rainfall these conditions and these are actually nothing but a simulation of these climatic events or some construction process which actually lead to these Coriolis accelerations. So then that the moving object will have the Coriolis acceleration which what we said is that A suffix C is equal to 2 V omega and Coriolis force is nothing but 2 times M into V omega where M is the mass of the moving object within the model. So the Coriolis effect is 2 M V omega. Now after having discussed the limitations we have introduced ourselves to that, that there are two types of machine configurations they are basically beam centrifuges and drum centrifuges and initially the beam centrifuges are known as balanced beam centrifuges and in the drum centrifuge we said that where you have a peripheral drum and then the central tool table we try to look into the details of these machine configurations. So the radial force acting on the central spindle should be minimized as sigma mr omega square 10 to 0 and this if you are having that means that the mass balance is actually happening on the both the sides and whether it is with a beam centrifuge or whether it is with a balanced beam centrifuge we actually have to ensure that sigma mr is equal to 0 that ensures that the horizontal the model can be rotated. Uh, within the plane of uh, rotation and the second issue is that uh, uh, you know the bearings of the, the centrifuge will be uh, you know unaffected. So a typical uh, balanced beam uh, uh, centrifuge is actually shown in this slide wherein you have the two baskets uh, wherein uh, the models of almost equivalent weight are placed and uh, it is subjected to rotation about a vertical axis in a horizontal plane where r is the radius and if weight of the model at which this acceleration say for example if the weight is say 2 tons or 20 kilo newtons and if the if if it is able to carry 20 kilo newtons at 100 g then what we call is that as far as the capacity of the machines is balanced beam or beam centrifuge equipments are concerned it is called as capacity which is g indicated as a g tons or g kilo newtons which is nothing but payload of the model that is 20 kilo newtons into at which the g level the 20 into 100 so it is something like called 2000 g kilo newton or 200 g ton capacity so the capacities of the equipments are actually indicated worldwide and then you know various ranges of capacities of the equipments are there throughout the world so we'll try to look into the different centrifuges which are actually there in the world the one of the early centrifuges in the world which actually was you know put forward by Russians that is after the Moscow Railway Transport University wherein we have got two swing baskets and then have you know the arm which is actually at the central the at the, at the, the connecting to the central spindle. So the pictorial or you know artistic view of the centrifuge which was, which was known earlier is uh, is the picture here wherein you have got the two baskets and uh, is called twin baskets and a central pedestal and arm arm or a beam of the centrifuge then uh, what we see here is uh, you know the uh, ruhr university bochum uh, centrifuge in germany where the radius of the uh, centrifuge is about uh, 4.125 meter uh, that means that the radius is measured from the center to the uh, from here to here that is perpendicular distance so it is 4.125 when the basket uh, swings up and the maximum g level of the capacity of this machine is 250 and the maximum payload which uh, can be mounted here is 2 tons so the capacity of the machine is uh, said as uh, uh, you know 400 g tons uh, that means that at uh, uh, payload at 100 g it can carry uh, you know uh, at 200 g it can carry 2 tons that is the 400 g tons capacity what we what we are actually referring. 
So this is a typical uh, balanced beam centrifuge where uh, uh, you know uh, has a radius of 4.125 meters and uh, this is the tunnel beam centrifuge. The, this is initially it was a restrained platform centrifuge afterwards with uh, the restrained centrifuge was converted into with the uh, a pivot mechanism uh, which is actually shown here and uh, the basket uh, uh, can be detachable and where the model is actually mounted and equivalent weights are actually placed here and so that sigma mr is equal to 0 is achieved here and this also actually has a radius of r is equal to 4.125 meter and maximum g is 150 and a capacity of this uh, equipment is 150 g tons capacity and wherein uh, you can actually see that uh, you know the uh, uh, you know the it is a fin uh, basket and, and this is the arm or a beam of the equipment. So this is in uh, you know an University of Cambridge in uh, United Kingdom. And this is you know Hong Kong edge coast centrifuge and this actually has a radius of 4.2 meters and maximum G level is 150 and the capacity of this machine is 400 G tons capacity. So this is also a balanced beam centrifuge and this is the RPA centrifuge in USA. The radius of this centrifuge is 3 meters, the maximum G level is 160 and maximum payload is 1.5 tons. And the capacity is 150 G tons at 100 G. So you can see here it can carry 1.5 tons load at 100 G. That is the reason why capacity is 150 G tons. And this is you know the balanced beam centrifuge where you have got a single basket or single swinging basket, and and this is the pedestal, and this is the adjustable counterweight. The counterweight is adjusted depending upon the the weight of the model which is actually kept. So if the model is heavier then the counterweight you know adjusts towards this side if the model is lighter the counterweight comes towards the center so that sigma mr is equal to 0 can be ensured. So this is the F star centrifuge in, in, in Paris in France and this is you know the also known as LCPC centrifuge. And where the radius of the centrifuge is 5.5 meters, this is also a beam centrifuge, and maximum G level is 160, and maximum payload is 2 tons, and the capacity is 2 ton, 200 G tons capacity at 100 G. So that means that at 2 tons it can carry at 100 G. That's why the capacity is called 200 G tons. So this is the the cased centrifuge wherein uh, uh, you know this is uh, also a balance uh, this beam centrifuge and uh, uh, what uh, what we look into all these uh, cables and these things they are like uh, you know for actuating earthquake uh, actuator and also the data acquisition components and all and this is also equivalent to the radius of about 5.5 meters uh, and uh, uh, the details are actually given uh, in Kim et al 2013. And this is the K water centrifuge and which is having a radius of about 8 meters and this is a again a beam centrifuge with a single basket. The basket area here in this case is about 2 meter by 2 meters and the maximum G level is 150 and the capacity of this centrifuge is 800 G tons. That means that it can carry a payload of about 8 tons at 100 G, 8 tons payload it can carry at 100 G that means that very large centrifuge models it can actually accommodate so that the models can be tested and this K water centrifuge was actually developed for studying problems like the dam instabilities and levy instabilities and other you know the water relevant you know the structures. And this is you know the small geotechnical centrifuge at IIT Bombay it was actually existing between 1994 to 2008. And this is a very small equipment where the bio centrifuge was actually converted into engineering geotechnical centrifuge where the radius is 0 0.32 meters and maximum G is 200 and the capacity is 0.4 G tons capacity. So this facility was actually used for geotechnical instruction as well as for some you know research problems which can be investigated within the you know the uh, errors which can be allowed in these uh, small centrifuges. 
So the payload uh, which is uh, very low is something like uh, 2.5 kg which actually can carry. So uh, here in this uh, particular model which is actually shown and which actually has got uh, the uh, you know some motor which uh, gets activated and uh, this uh, uh, you know the counterweight is actually used for supporting uh, you know the uh, uh, weight of this uh, package which is actually shown here. So this is uh, the IIT Bombay's uh, large beam centrifuge facility. The radius is about 4.5 meters, maximum G level is 200 and the capacity is 250 G tons and uh, this is one of the indigenously built equipment and uh, it actually has got regenerative braking system and in flight balancing and uh, com when compared to the contemporary equipments this actually has got high payload capacity and uh, uh, the G level which actually ranges from uh, 10 gravity to 200 gravities. In order to reach 200 gravities uh, it can actually reach from 1G to 200G in 6 minutes. Similarly from uh, 200G to 1G it can actually come down or ramp down in uh, 6 minutes that is so, so it actually has got a two different ramping speeds one is uh, 34 rpm per uh, uh, meter the other one uh, per, per minute uh, 34 rpm per minute the other one is 3.4 rpm per minute. So when you compare the capacity of the major balanced and beam centrifuges uh, in the world uh, wherein uh, some of the equipment which we have discussed uh, then IIT Bombay uh, equipment falls somewhere here between 100 G ton capacity to 500 G ton capacity and some of the new Korean centrifuge actually falls very close to you know 800 G ton capacity and UC Davis which they have the equipment which is very close to 1000 G ton capacity wherein their arm radius is about 9.5 meters. So you know what we have is that you know this particular chart is actually for maximum acceleration. Uh, and then uh, uh, and then this is the payload so you can see that uh, uh, iit bombay uh, centrifuge which actually can carry at uh, 2500 kg at uh, 100 g that's why it is actually somewhere here it is actually located so this is the ipstar centrifuge very close to the uh, you know and then uh, cambridge centrifuge is somewhere here so uh, after having discussed uh, different uh, 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 beam centrifuges or balanced beam centrifuges. Now let us look into the drum centrifuges which is a this is a typical drum centrifuge uh, uh, pictorial view uh, which is at Tokyo Institute of Technology Japan and uh, here uh, as has been told that uh, there is a periphery uh, which is actually exists and uh, wherein uh, what it is called as uh, the aspect ratio of the channel. So wherein it is uh, uh, 1.2 meter in the diameter 0 0.5, 0 0.15 meter deep and 0.3 meter wide. So wherein in this channel the models are actually made like this for example here an embankment model is actually made uh, uh, with uh, a uh, after having uh, made with certain uh, clay then what is actually is done is that uh, it is actually scrapped it is uh, this portion is removed and this portion is removed then the shape is actually achieved and then you know then it can be tested for certain uh, uh, testing. So what we can see is that here a particular model which is actually mounted here a uplift capacity of a certain anchor which is actually embedded in soil is being tested and this payload capacity is actually 0 0.6 tons and a max acceleration maximum acceleration is 484 and the capacity is 290 g tons capacity. So the aspect ratio of the soil channel which actually said is that 1.25 1.2 meter diameter 0.15 meter deep and 0.3 meter wide. And uh, here uh, one advantage is that uh, you know uh, given uh, stress history uh, number of uh, uh, you know the tests can be done. Uh, then second thing is that uh, also as I has been informed before that uh, elastic of space problems can be simulated because of the large extent of the uh, you know uh, areas uh, from uh, both sides of the model being tested. Then the preparation of the uh, you know model uh, in a drum centrifuge uh, which is actually is uh, trivial and this is how the sand models are actually constructed uh, uh, where the sand is actually allowed to drop onto a central uh, rotating plate and both this side as well as this rotates about vertical axis in a horizontal manner in a synchronized way. 
then what will happen is that these particles are actually thrown tangentially on the periphery like how these the sand models are done and similarly some clay models uh, which are actually done by feeding uh, either sand uh, this is either feeding the sand through uh, nozzle uh, so that the sand is actually dropped on to the uh, you know the channel which is being constructed uh, which is being used for constructing a, a particular model. So this is the one of the largest uh, you know drum centrifuges in the world and uh, this is the ETH jury uh, drum centrifuge and uh, the pictorial view is actually shown here wherein uh, this is the model in which they this be constructed and uh, this is the periphery of the drum which is actually shown here and this is the central tool table and uh, when the test is in progress uh, where you will actually see that both uh, the central tool table as well as the drum rotates in a about said vertical axis in a synchronized manner. So this is actually about 2.2 meters in diameter that is about 1.1 meters in radius and wherein you can see that you know this is a particular case you know the investigation which is actually for stone column reinforced clay being investigated what you see the dots are the model stone columns. So this is the a you know ETH Juric drum centrifuge. Now after having discussed about the relationship between the ramp angle the, the, the different machine configurations and what we said is that we have got beam centrifuges or balanced beam centrifuges or we have you know the drum centrifuges. In the case of the drum centrifuge the model is actually prepared within the channel which is attached to the periphery of the drum. Uh, and nowadays uh, you know some of the uh, drum centrifuges are also equipped with uh, some baskets wherein the baskets are actually uh, attached to the uh, you know the periphery of the drum. So with that uh, you know uh, some confined models can be uh, you know tested and uh, now as far as the beam centrifuge or balanced beam centrifuge is concerned uh, we need to understand what is the relationship between uh, ramp angle that is the angle which is subtended by the basket when it is actually in the at 1G condition that is when the basket is in 1G condition the basket will be vertical and the weight will be acting downwards and when it you know rotation starts about vertical axis in a horizontal plane let us say that this is the omega which is actually rotating about vertical axis then there is you know the swinging up of the angle basket takes place. So at any point of time of T once it starts rotation of a uh, you know the more uh, basket the swing uh, centrifuge about the vertical axis that the angle be theta then you know assume that these are the radial axis and this is the uh, y axis vertical and uh, and this is the frictionless hinge where uh, you have got a tangential force acting uh, like this and the normal force acting upwards and uh, and this is the model package and then uh, with the model package and uh, the basket weight they assume that this is the center of mass that is the point P which is actually the weight acting downwards including the basket weight as well as uh, uh, this is actually acting downwards. Now by taking uh, uh, you know this angle is theta and this is mg now and this point from the distance from the hinge to uh, the point P uh, which is uh, you know the distance is L. So uh, this distance is uh, L sin theta. So if this is radius from central of the center of the shaft to the center point of the hinge it is r suffix h r suffix h plus you know l sin theta where r is equal to r h plus l sin theta. Now by taking you know sigma f r is equal to 0 and sigma f y is equal to 0 we can write sigma f r is equal to 0 if you write you know what actually happens is that when the model rotates about the vertical axis in a horizontal plane there is a radial acceleration which actually develop and the radial force which actually develop the centrifugal force which is nothing but mr omega square has to be balanced by the t. So t is equal to mr omega square. So we can write t is equal to m omega square into for substituting r is equal to r plus l sin theta. So the r is nothing but r r h plus l sin theta which is indicated as r here r h plus l sin theta and by taking sigma f i is equal to 0 we can write n minus m g where is the n g and neglecting the vertical acceleration. So if there is no angular acceleration of the model about its center of the mass p and so there can be no moments and we can actually assume that the resultant of t and n passes through the center of the gravity. 
that is the center of mass point P. So the resultant of T and N that means that this angle N tan theta tan theta, tan theta is equal to tan theta is equal to T by N and that angle tan theta is equal to T by N. So we can write that T is equal to N tan theta. Now by taking N is equal to mg and then substituting from sigma fr is equal to 0 whatever the expression we got T is equal to m omega square into r plus l sin theta for n we substituting m. So it is mg tan theta is equal to m omega square into rh plus l sin theta. Now what will happen is that m and m will get cancelled so this indicates that the ramp angle is independent of the you know the mass so what we get the expression after simplification we get that g tan theta is equal to r omega square uh, one uh, divided by one plus uh, l by uh, r sin theta. So where uh, the r is small r is nothing but r h plus uh, l sin theta. So what we can actually do, what it means is that um, you know the this equation where, you know, once you know these uh, configurations we can actually calculate what is the uh, you know the ramp angle. That is, you know, this is this is theta is there in both left hand side as well as right hand side. So we actually need to use the iteration process so that we'll be able to get the relationship between theta and omega. So as the omega, you know, reaches to certain value, what we tend to see is that the theta becomes close to 90 degrees, and then it remains constant. Then that means that that is the point what we can actually say that you know the the desired gravity level is actually achieved for once the desired gravity level is achieved either we do a test at constant gravity level or at the variable gravity level. So this is you know the swing in action of the IIT Bombay large centrifuge in action is shown and this view is actually obtained by a camera which is actually located in the center and wherein uh, the camera gives the swinging up of the angle, uh, swing of the of the basket. So what we can see is that the model actually is uh, uh, swinging up, and it remains in that horizontal position as long as uh, you know the machine is actually uh, you know under uh, rotation. So this is uh, uh, you know large centrifuge in action at uh, IIT Bombay. So once again the view is being shown okay. Now after having seen the you know how the you know machine when it is subjected to rotation about vertical axis it swings up and attains some constant you know the ramp angle. So now in this particular slide the variation of the ramp angle theta with rpm omega for a radius of 4.5 meter radius beam centrifuge is shown here. So what can be seen is that by using that equation this has been founded with R h is equal to 3.3 meters and L is equal to 0.815 meters. So the from the center of the hinge to top surface of the basket is it is you know about 1.2 meters. So this is actually assumed as 0.815 meters. So once this is calculated what actually it appears is that about 34 to 35 rpm you know then it actually attains so called the horizontality and you know the angle will be very close to 90 degrees but it cannot be 90 degrees why because there is a 1g gravity which is actually acting downwards. So even the what we have discussed is that radial acceleration field when it is actually happening the ng which is acting towards the model and then 1g is actually acting downwards. What we have is that the resultant gravity level which is the one which we need to consider this is nothing but root over n square plus 1 into g. So if you say that n is equal to 100 that 100 square plus 1 root over which is almost equivalent to 100 point you know some decimals into times g so which is regarded as 100 g. And this is for a you know typical 1.1 meter radius centrifuge. Uh, where in uh, where R H is equal to 0.74 meters that is from the center of the shaft to uh, you know the center of the hinge and L is actually assumed as 0.22 meter here. So 
uh, this, Im this implies that uh, the smaller the radius it actually takes longer rpm to become uh, the flat form to be horizontal. So, it takes about 210 to 220 rpm uh, to actually acquire an angle of about 89 degrees or so. So, uh, it actually implies that uh, if the smaller the radius uh, the beam centrifuges can only be used um, above a certain omega value up to that, uh, that time. Uh, you know we cannot actually claim that the, the gravity conditions have been achieved and these are actually called as pseudo gravity conditions. So, the one point we need to note down is that the mass is actually independent of that when we are calculating the ramp angle the mass is independent the, from the uh, you know the discussion whatever we had and second issue is that the beam centrifuges can only be used above a certain uh, omega. Uh, so, wherein uh, we can actually uh, uh, you know get the the desired uh, you know uh, rpm but beyond which uh, we can actually can be used for example if uh, radius of 1.1 meter uh, is used so that means that uh, you know the centrifuge test cannot be performed anything less than 200 210 rpm so uh, you know then you know the scaling glass which we are actually going to discuss it cannot be applied uh, appropriately so uh, and before uh, discussing about this scaling glass let us look into the you know these uh, simple assumptions which are actually involved and uh, the earlier the scaling glass were actually deduced by Crosse in 1988 and it is also by stat uh, the based on the uh, you know the stati the definitions the fundamental definitions uh, the uh, you know the scaling glass have been deduced uh, by Crosse some of the fundamental definition uh, fundamental assumptions which actually have been put forward is that the soil can be treated as a continuum uh, that means that different parts of the model are uh, many times larger than the soil grains that means that if I have a length of the container the length of the container should be many many times larger than the uh, soil grains. Similarly if you are actually having uh, a footing the footing should have reasonably large when you compare with the size of the grain. So, that actually will uh, you know the soil can be treated as a continuum this is one of the conventional assumption in uh, soil mechanics and the soil properties are not affected by the change in acceleration because we said that in uh, centrifuge based physical modeling the we in order to acquire the identical stresses in model prototype we said that gamma m is equal to n gamma p. So, wherein gamma is equal to rho into g uh, with that uh, you know with g m by g p is equal to n if you are able to achieve with identical soil as that in the prototype uh, what we said is that the gamma m becomes n gamma p. So, that means that you know the soil properties are not affected by change in acceleration except the you know unit weight which is actually determining the uh, you know the result of the self weight. So, the force of the uh, this uh, you know uh, the uh, for the explanation for this uh, you know uh, this assumption was actually given by Schofield in 1980. The it is said that the force of the gravity acts at the center of the mass of each atom and does not significantly affect the electron shells which determine the all material properties other than the self weight. So, only except the self weight the rest of the properties were assumed to be not affected. So, this assumption you know ensures that you know identical soil properties like C and phi and that also we actually have deduced from the you know the dimensional analysis or the theory of the models that they should be identical in model and prototype. So, these are the some fundamental assumptions as far as the scaling glass in centrifuge modeling is concerned. Now, coming to the similitude in geotechnical engineering wherein the it is the like in conventional fluid mechanics wherein we actually have the similitude definitions like linear similitude, kinematic similitude and dynamic similitude. So, wherein the linear similitude in the sense that whatever the dimensions which are actually there in prototype they have to be scaled by 1 by n times and the factor is constant for all the dimensions that means that if I have a length and breadth and height then it is length in model and prototype uh, which is also called as a length scale factor NL uh, and breadth scale factor BM by BP and height scale factor HM by HP it has to be reduced by 1 by N. And if the length and breadth are actually reduced by 1 by N then uh, area which is nothing but AM by AP is equal to 1 by N square and uh, similarly the volumes are reduced by uh, 1 by N cube that is that VM by VP is equal to 1 by N cube. And uh, so this is uh, as far as the linear similitude is concerned and uh, similarly kinematic similitude is concerned wherein we have Vm by Vp is equal to Nv that is nothing but the uh, scale factor for uh, velocity 
and similarly the accelerations am by ap has to be equal to na that is the as far as the uh, scaling factor for the acceleration is concerned. So velocities and accelerations they also have to be scaled and then the similarity need to be maintained. Similarly uh, you know when for all for an identical soil in modern prototype with the rho m is equal to rho p the scale factor for uh, you know mass and volume they are equal that is nothing but n m is equal to n m is nothing n suffix m is nothing but the scale factor for mass is equal to n suffix v is equal to 1 by n cube. The dynamic similitude is nothing but f m by f p is equal to n f uh, wherein uh, you know uh, you know we can actually say that this in the in the in the case of dynamic similitude uh, even if you have different forces like seepage forces uh, or let us say uh, you know creep forces or some viscous forces or if you are having some dynamic forces or if you are actually having uh, uh, some weight forces whatever may be the type of type of the force uh, what dynamic dynamic similitude says that the dynamic similitude says that it actually should have a constant uh, scale uh, scale factor uh, for the force then only we can say that the dynamic similitude is satisfied. So for identical effective stresses in model and prototype and what we, we say is that the n sigma dash that is the scale factor for effective stress n sigma uh, scale factor for total stress n u the scale factor for pore water pressure where we have sigma dash by sigma p dash is equal to sigma by sigma m by sigma p is equal to u m by u p where u is nothing but the pore water pressure uh, in model and prototype. So this pore water pressure is nothing but uh, defined as gamma w into the height let us say h small h. So uh, you know when we have the gamma w in model is n times uh, gamma w in prototype then even the uh, with a reduced column of water uh, height of water what we actually get is that identical pore water pressure as that in the prototype. When you have the identical pore water pressure as that in the prototype and when you have the identical uh, stresses uh, total stresses in model and prototype are identical then the effective stresses are identical. When we have the effective stresses identicality is achieved then the soil uh, stress strain behavior or the soil shear strength is actually simulated uh, accordingly. So now here uh, the scaling factor for the, the loss in centrifuge modeling uh, as we have said that from the linear similitude point of view length and uh, breadth and height are reduced by 1 by n. So in that case the displacements they can be due to settlements or, uh, or pile deflections uh, or there can be a, uh, you know the lateral deflection of a wall and uh, these displacements have to be uh, 1 by n times as that in the prototype that means that if you are having uh, a 500 mm displacement and at uh, 50 g uh, that means that it is about uh, only 10 mm displacement it should record. So that, that means that uh, the delta m is equal to delta p by n. So as we have scaled down the length dimensions of the prototype by a factor n in the centrifuge model the scaling for the settlement would be. Uh, you know 1 by n that means that as we have scaled the length scale factor by 1 by n times the, the displacements have to be also 1 by n. So the settlements in the centrifuge model are 1 by n times that in the prototype. So similarly the areas which are actually involved let us say a m by a p is equal to 1 by n square. So let us uh, if you look into you know something like uh, uh, point, uh, uh, 0.72 meters by uh, point three, point 0.36 meters area at 40 gravities. So this actually represents about 450, 415 square meters of area uh, in the in the field conditions. So uh, this actually represents even the small areas when they are actually tested at a higher uh, uh, gravity level. So there is a possibility that they represent the large areas under consideration. Similarly, the volumes which are actually involved, Vm by Vp is equal to 1 by n cube. Then the uh, we have already proved that uh, the stresses are identical in centrifuge in model and prototype. Uh, we said that uh, uh, the stress in the model and uh, uh, prototype are identical uh, because of the enhancement of the uh, the unit weight. So with that, sigma m by sigma p is equal to one. And we also have said that as uh, because as we have scaled down the maintaining this linear similitude of uh, you know length dimensions, then the displacements or settlements have to be one by n times that of the prototype. So the strain uh, you know which is uh, caused the strain in the body is actually caused due to uh, you know the displacements of the particles or it, uh, the total uh, displacement of a body that means that uh, you know it, it can be within the soil mass means this can be due to the crushing of the soil particles uh, and uh, you know the uh, and bending of the soil particles in case of clays 
So the strain which is actually nothing but it can be due to some distortion or due to crushing of the grains or due to movement of a rigid body. So if you define the strain as a d sigma by sigma and with now as sigma m by sigma p is 1 by n so that small change in the displacement that also has to be small that is d sigma in model is equal to d sigma p by n. So with, with this what we can say that you know with sigma m by sigma p is equal to 1 by n and the d sigma in model is equal to d sigma p by n. So epsilon p epsilon m and epsilon p is equal to 1. So this ensures that identical stresses and strains in model and prototype and this actually has got you know, you know the relevance as far as the stress strain behavior of the soil is concerned. So this we have discussed that if you are actually having you know model behave the model 1G model test conducted at a small stresses. So initially the model actually will have you know one you know very low stresses because you know when we have the low stresses at low stresses the soil will actually have higher stiffness and though the scale factor from the dimension analysis says that delta m by delta m is equal to delta p by n. Uh, by the virtue of the similitude modeling, but what actually uh, you know uh, we measure uh, is that in the model test is that uh, you know the less uh, settlements uh, uh, in the uh, for the structure being constructed. But when we look into the real prototype stress conditions where the stresses are high and as the strains are actually high, the stiffness of the soil actually falls. So with that, the real prototype uh, conditions when it is actually there with the real stresses. Uh, and uh, then what is actually happen is that the stiffness is low so the settlements are actually large. So this actually shows uh, that you know uh, the soil behavior is uh, uh, actually highly nonlinear and plastic. So in order to capture uh, you know this uh, you know uh, the uh, you know the identical behavior the creation of the full scale stresses and strains in the small scale models is very very important. This slide we have already discussed but you know to bring the relevance of the you know as we are discussing about the stress and strain modeling we actually trying to bring this discussion once again. Now let us look into different aspects of the scaling loss in centrifuge modeling. So here like we have a force work and energy now the considering the basic definitions of Newton's second law of motion and we can say that a force f acting on the body we can actually define as f is equal to m a where m is the mass and then a is the acceleration. So force acting on the body in the direction of that acceleration. So in order to get the scale factor for force fm by fp is equal to mm by mp divided into am by ap and with mm by mp is equal to 1 by n cube because we have used the same soil as that in the prototype with maintaining rho m by rho p is equal to 1 and reducing the volume vm by ap is equal to vm by vp is equal to 1 by n cube the mm by mp is equal to 1 by n cube and enhancing the acceleration by n times then it is am is equal to n ap. So what we get is that fm by fp is equal to 1 by n square. So this actually has the, the practical relevance of this is that if you are having say 3000 kilo newton of force in a 50 gravities centrifuge test the scales down to be only 1200 newtons that means that a 300 3000 kilo newton force in a 50 g centrifuge test scales down to only 1.2 kilo newtons. So for example this is a case for for example if you wanted to do the lateral load capacity of a large Kaizen foundation then you need to develop a 3000 kilo newtons in the sense that 6000 kilo newton restraining capacity kentledge many many times I know these type of situations are you know difficult to achieve in the field. And this is another advantage of a centrifuge test that as we can actually make actuators to load piles retaining walls or slopes or embankments or dams and forces that need to be applied by these actuators are relatively small. So you know this is another advantage of the merit of the centrifuge if actually if you look into it we can make the actuators to apply very very, very small forces but these forces correspond to, to the forces which are actually you know correspond in the by applying, applying the appropriate scaling conditions as per the, the gravity level being considered. So this is you know the score factor for the force is concerned. Similarly consider you know the work 
the basic definition of the work done W is nothing but the product of the force uh, through a distance uh, moving through a distance D that means that W is equal to F into D. So uh, the work energy the work done uh, in moving the, uh, the uh, by moving the body uh, by a force M through a distance D is uh, given by W is equal to F into D where Wm suffix M by Wm suffix P is equal to Fm by Fp into Dm by Dp. Uh, now uh, having known with uh, Fm by Fp is equal to 1 by n square and uh, Dm by Dp is equal to 1 by n. Dm by Dp is nothing but the distance uh, from the linear similitude point of view it is scaled by 1 by n times. So with that uh, you know when you substitute back what we get is that Wm by Wp is equal to 1 by n cube. So the scaling law for work done suggests that the work done in a centrifuge model is relatively small compared to that in the prototype. The work done is nothing but Wp by n cube that means that one, the work done in the centrifuge model for the same energy is actually is you know is compared to is very small. So this is also another advantage as far as the centrifuge is concerned. So the scaling law for the work done suggests that the work done in the centrifuge model is relatively small. Uh, compared to that in the prototype. Now uh, after having discussed about the work as far as the definition of uh, the units and uh, uh, is concerned in the, from the physics definition is concerned work and energy are equal but uh, consider the definition of uh, the potential energy the potential energy PE which is uh, equal to normally uh, expressed as uh, energy lost uh, by falling mass M through a height H. So wherein uh, PE uh, which is nothing but uh, we can actually say that P is equal to mgh. So we can say that P in model and P in prototype uh, which is nothing but uh, we can actually write it like uh, the product of uh, mm by mp and gm by gp and hm by hp. So with uh, mm by mp is equal to 1 by n cube and uh, the acceleration uh, which is n times that is gm by gp is equal to n and hm by hp which is equal to 1 by n. So we can write that the potential energy in model prototype is 1 by n times. So here uh, which actually says that you know uh, the centrifuge model can offer a very effective way of in investigating see for example when you are trying uh, to see the energy which is actually released due to uh, some explosion or a, a blast load effect on certain uh, geotechnical structures or a buildings or earthen dams or dams or a training structures uh, without the need to conduct these at full scales many times uh, they are expensive and uh, they are damaging to the environment. So in such situations the centrifuge modeling offers an uh, effective way of investigating the effect of uh, effects of these explosions on these buildings wherein the energies are actually modeled uh, which is uh, you know uh, which is uh, nothing but uh, uh, 1 by n cube times that of the energy of the prototype but say PEP uh, which is uh, nothing but uh, n cube times uh, potential energy. Suppose this concept is something like if you are doing a, a type of ground improvement technique like uh, you know dynamic uh, compaction wherein uh, a known weight uh, is actually dropped over a height h with a potential energy uh, you know h. So wherein uh, what we actually get is that uh, you know uh, the 1 by n cube. So this uh, concept of uh, you know the energy modeling. Uh, can be used for understanding some problems like uh, the liquefaction mitigation measures or a ground improvement methods like dynamic compaction uh, wherein uh, we will be able to uh, simulate with identical stresses and uh, strain fields uh, we will be able to see the response of a particular model applied with uh, different energies where the, the different uh, parametric studies can be done, done. Similarly the kinetic energy kinetic energy which is also again said as half mv square. And with that with the kinetic energy also is modeled as 1 by n cube wherein half mv square when this mass is actually is mm by nb is 1 by n cube and wherein velocity at present as far as the, the dynamic velocity or the motion is concerned which is vm is equal to vp and wherein with that what it actually tells is that the kinetic energy in model prototype is 1 by n cube. Uh, uh, so with that uh, 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 what actually happens is that now the work energy and uh, you know potential energy and kinetic energy it is actually modeled as uh, 1 by n cube. So let us say that uh, we are actually interested in studying a impact load uh, on the uh, you know uh, on a particular foundation suppose a ship impact load on the pile foundation wherein the uh, certain weight of a uh, 
uh, model is actually uh, the moving weight is released and to hit make it to hit the uh, you know the uh, foundation. So that actually marks the marks the uh, you know the modeling of the uh, impact on the uh, particular foundation. So in this particular lecture uh, what we try to understand is that uh, you know different uh, uh, you know the scaling loss the basic scaling loss which are actually required for uh, centrifuge modeling uh, and then uh, you know further we have you know different pro forces like seepage forces or uh, we have uh, some dynamic forces or we have some weight forces or with the weight forces are uh, basically they are uh, you know due to body forces or due to the structurally externally applied loadings that is nothing but uh, you know application of a uh, load to a footing or application of load to a lateral load to a uh, foundation. Uh, then in that situations uh, this actually scales down uh, you know we are required to understand uh, the, the scaling loss. Uh, then uh, you know the, we in this particular lecture we actually try to look into the basic uh, you know parameter which actually as far relevant to centrifuge modeling the scaling loss. Then we also have seen uh, different machine configurations and we said that different type machines which are balanced beam and beam centrifuges which are some select machines are actually are uh, you know shown. Then we also have deduced a relationship between uh, ramp angle and uh, omega that is uh, the, uh, the angular velocity of the model. Then we said that the beam centrifuges can be used depending upon the type of the configuration of the equipment. The smaller the uh, you know radius then they can be used only up to the RPMs will be large to attain this uh, you know uh, the so called uh, 89.5 or a 90 degrees uh, horizontal plane. So uh, you know th that means that they can be used only beyond that certain RPM. Uh, otherwise uh, you know the pseudo up to that stage actually what it actually said is that the pseudo gravity conditions provide. Then uh, we also have discussed that uh, you know uh, the typical uh, beam set uh, the uh, drum centrifuges which are actually available and uh, how uh, you know the model preparation can be done uh, by using sands in a drum centrifuge actually uh, was introduced. Uh, 